Let me now give you some strategies for solving Newton's second law problems. The first thing that you should do is always to draw a picture of the problem that you have at hand. A picture as complete and detailed as possible. Suppose that the problem that you are trying to solve is the acceleration of a block as it slides down an inclined plane that has an angle theta. There is no friction between the block and the incline. The block has a mass m and you're looking for the acceleration. So a nice sketch of that would be as shown where it is clear and it helps you keep in mind that what you're after is the acceleration of the block and it shows you some of the information that you have. Let me draw this up here. The second step is to identify the object of interest. Draw a circle around it so Newton's second law equations will be applied to this object and not to the incline and not to the table and not to the earth. The third step would be to make a list of all of the objects in direct contact with your object of interest. This step is very important because the only objects that can put a force on your object of interest are the objects that are touching it plus the earth that can exert a gravitational force. So if you identify the objects that are touching the object of interest, you'll be on your way to identifying correctly all the forces acting on your object. For the example that we're using here, the list of objects that are in contact with the block has only one entry, that would be the incline. The incline is the only object in this example that can put a force on the block apart from the Earth with gravity. The fourth step is to draw a free body diagram. To draw a free body diagram, you need to select the orientation of the x and the y axis that you're going to choose. Then you're going to draw the object at the origin of the x and y axis as a dot. You don't care about the shape of the object at this point, just draw it as a dot. Show all the forces that arise from the contact between the target and the objects included in the list in step 3. Do not forget to include the force of gravity if the object is located near a large object such as the Earth. Also, make sure to draw your force vectors with the correct directions. Don't be sloppy. Physics eats sloppy people for breakfast. If your free body diagram is sloppy, you will make mistakes. In your free body diagram, also indicate all the angles clearly, the angles that the different force vectors make with the x or y axis. In the example that we're working on, you could choose the x and the y axis, horizontal axis, the x, vertical, the y, the vectors that arise from the interaction with the objects nearby are the normal and the gravitational force. The normal is the force that the incline puts on the block. The incline is touching the block, therefore there is a force associated with that, and as we will discuss more in detail, normal forces are perpendicular to the surface in contact. So your normal force in this example would point uh, in a direction that makes an angle theta with the vertical axis, the same theta that is the angle of the incline. The force of gravity points straight down along the vertical axis. And an additional vector that is always useful to draw nearby, not in your free body diagram, but near it, is the acceleration vector. One thing that you know about this block is that the direction in which it accelerates is parallel to the surface of the incline. So your acceleration vector, if you were to choose the x and y axis this way, would be a vector that has an x and a y component and that it makes an angle of theta from the horizontal. Another possibility for the uh, free body diagram is to choose your axis with the x-axis parallel to the surface of the incline and the y-axis perpendicular. This is actually a better option. The reason is that, as you can see here, the normal vector is now parallel to the y-axis. It doesn't have two components anymore. And in addition to that, the acceleration vector which is a vector that would show up on the right-hand side of Newton's second law when you write it down, that acceleration now has only one component. The acceleration is now parallel to the x-axis. 
So by tilting the axis this way, by choosing your axis parallel to the incline and perpendicular, you have gotten rid of two components for your n, for your normal vector and for your acceleration vector. Now you're dealing with one component for the normal and one component for the acceleration. The other components of those two vectors are zero. The only vector that now has two components is the force of gravity. But overall, this choice of the axis has simplified your problem by reducing the total number of components that you have to deal with. The fifth step is to write Newton's second law for each one of the direction, the x direction and the y direction. So let me redraw here the free body diagram in the way that seems more useful, which is with the tilted axis, the acceleration vector shown in blue. Once you have a nice, clean, free body diagram, step number five is going to be much easier. In step number five, you're writing, you're spelling out what is the net force in, let's start with the x direction. So in this case, we have the uh, forces acting in, along the x direction is only the x component of the force of gravity. The vector force of gravity has two components, the y component as shown and the x component and that x component is the one that we need to use when uh, writing down Newton's second law for the x direction. How do we obtain that x component? Well that x component is the same as the opposite side of the angle and that side, the opposite side of an angle for a right angle triangle is obtained by the hypotenuse multiplied by the sine of the angle. So the only force that has an x component is the force of gravity and that component is given by Fg sine theta. The next thing to do is to write the right hand side of Newton's second law which is m times x component of the acceleration. Because of the way we chose the x and the y axis, the x component of the acceleration is the same as the acceleration. So we just have ma on the right hand side. So for the x component, we arrive at equation number one that says fg sine of theta equals ma. Now it's time to examine the situation in the y direction. The sum of the forces in the y direction are the normal force, which is positive, and negative the y component of the force of gravity which you can see that corresponds to the adjacent side of the right angle triangle with angle theta so the adjacent according to uh, trigonometry is the hypotenuse fg multiplied by the cosine of the angle so the y component of the force of gravity is fg cosine theta so we put that in our equation for the net force and what remains is to make this sum equal to the mass times the acceleration in the y direction. That acceleration is zero since the acceleration vector does not have a component along the y-axis. The block slides down the incline remaining in contact with the incline at all times which means that the acceleration as well as the velocity in the vertical direction must be zero. So using this we finally write the second equation that tells us that the normal force should be equal to the force of gravity multiplied by the cosine of theta. We have now two equations and we are looking for the acceleration of the block. The next step is to solve the equations for the unknowns. We're looking for the acceleration. We can use the first equation fg sine theta equals ma to directly solve for the acceleration. From that equation we get the acceleration is fg sine theta divided by m and if we use the fact that the force of gravity, as we'll see later, is the mass times gravity, you can replace that in the equation above and get for the acceleration mg sine theta divided by m, cancel the m, and you get the final answer for the acceleration as being g sine theta. So when the block slides down an incline without friction, if the incline has an angle of theta with the horizontal, the block would move down the incline with an acceleration equal to g sine theta. Notice that we arrive at our answer without using equation number two, the one that said fg cosine theta equals n. That is okay. You don't always have to use all of the equations to find your answer. 
equations are only tools as and if one of the tools is enough or two is enough to find the answer that is perfectly okay what's important is that once you find your answer you do the last step in this strategy which is to check your result does your result make sense one way to check is if you have a result that is in terms of variables is to give some numerical values to those variables and see what your result is for those numbers so if you use for example theta equals zero your equation our final answer g sine theta tells us that the acceleration of the block should be zero so you ask yourself does this make sense or not what you have for theta equals zero is a block sitting on a flat surface when you put a block on a table the block doesn't accelerate even if there is no friction between the block and the table there has to be some sort of inclination on that table to make that block move so getting an acceleration equal to zero in that case makes perfect sense you might want to check for a different value of the angle say 90 degrees which gives you an acceleration of g once again this makes sense because when the angle theta is 90 degrees it's just like dropping a block next to a wall the block doesn't really interact with the wall and it just accelerates with the acceleration of gravity 9.8 meters per second square so once again you have verified that the final answer makes sense and you can be confident that it is the right answer